So Matthew chapter 28, I don't know the verse, but maybe some of you can be able to find it. In Matthew chapter 28, I, uh, the last two verses, I believe, the last two or three verses, what did God tell his Christians? That's how Christianity started. How Bible-believing Christianity started was through this command. He said, go ye into all the worlds and, pre and teach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So that's probably how the verse reads. But when G the Lord Jesus Christ gave that command, He gave it to 11 apostles and only a few hundred Christians, perhaps, that time. So Christianity was a minority. It was started by, think about this, a Jew, a carpenter's son. Yet how did such a movement become so powerful and lead us to today, surviving for thousands of years? Our Bible-believing history is very, very rich. How we start our Christianity, the first word where Christian came from was from Antioch. Antioch. The Bible says at the book of Acts, it was at Antioch where they were first called Christians. And that's how Christianity started out. In Acts chapter 2, there was a great revival where the Apostle Peter preached and churches were planning and then it was spreading. God's movement was spreading. And the name Christian came out later on at the city of Antioch. This was the heart of Bible-believing Christianity, Antioch. It was at Antioch where we received the copies of the manuscripts of our King James Bible, the Byzantine manuscripts around Antioch, Syrian area. The Christians were heavily persecuted and tortured during this time period. Satan wanted to wipe Christianity off the map. So in order to do that, why not use bloody persecution and wipe them off the face of the earth? In fact, so much blood was poured out. So many Christians were tortured and persecuted that the lions, they were sick and tired of eating more Christians because their bellies were full of so many dead bodies of Christians. Governors who were all bloodthirsty and enjoyed the, enter the entertainment of Christians getting slaughtered at the Colosseums were now so sick and tired with the slaughter, conscience was bothering them, and they even begged some of the Caesars to stop the persecution of the Christians. That's how much blood was poured. You know why? Because you believe in an adversary, right? And when you believe in an adversary, you will realize also how important our history is. And our adversary, he wanted to wipe them off the face of the earth. Blood was spilled. Diocletian, his persecution was infamously known for thousands and thousands of Christians. In fact, he killed so many thousands of Christians, Diocletian was one time cried out, the name of Christian is extinguished. But you know what? Christianity increased even more. Right. Women and little children would hold hands and surround each other. And they would sing hymns as the lions came out of their dens and tore them to pieces. Old men were being crucified on crosses and they appreciated dying like the Lord Jesus Christ. The soldiers in mockery of some of the Christians thrust a spear on their side, decorated a crown of thorns on their heads, crucified them on crosses. But you know what? Some of the Christians took that as a privilege to die just like how the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior, died. I mean, it was unthinkable. Christianity was getting so powerful and the devil couldn't stop it. The 12 apostles during this time period, or the 11 apostles more exactly, but Matthias who joined the 12, most of these apostles were actually martyred. That's how they ended their lives. Most of them died being martyred for the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of them, if you read their story, some of them died actually street preaching against some of the pagan festivals and some of the sins that the people were committing. That's how they died for Jesus Christ. You see how Bible believers were like back then? Yep. What happened to today? What happened to today? You need a rich church and nice building, rich cushions. You need to have social programs and a lot of people. That's not how Bible-believing Christianity Amen. was built back then. Polycarp, one of the early Christian leaders of that time period, who, he was discipled under the Apostle John that time. Polycarp, in his 80s, he was tied to a stake, and he was going to be burnt alive for Jesus Christ. When he was told to recant, Polycarp cried out, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king, king who has saved me? 
And so, you know what? They got angry and they burned him at the stake. But you know what? He was still alive. So one got so angry that he thrust Polycarp with a spear. But when he thrust him with the spear, the blood poured out and doused the first fire. And he was still breathing. They got so mad that they had to light a second fire on top of that to finish the job. That's how he died for the Lord Jesus Christ. Ignatius was another early Christian leader. Leader During that time when he was arrested, Ignatius told the Christians, don't you dare come and rescue me. Don't you dare come and get me out of this prison. I want to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, when he came out of the de uh, when he came out of prison and the lions start to come out of their dens, Ignatius welcomed the lions with open arms and he told them to eat him because he was actually their bread, he said. Quote, I am the wheat of Christ. I am going to be ground with the teeth of wild beasts that I may be found pure bread. You know what the plain English of that is? If you don't understand archaic English, King James English, go ahead and eat me up. I'm your dinner. That's what he basically said. Tertullian, perhaps the best Bible-believing leader of that time period, Tertullian, he one time cried out. He one time wrote about this martyrdom of the Christians. He said this, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Basically, he was saying, you're just planting more and more fruit, more and more vegetables of us Bible-believing Christians. Let the blood spill. Let the blood pour. And you know what? Satan had enough of that. So he's like, okay, this is not doing the job. So what did he do? While you got one stream of Bible-believing Christianity going on, you got another stream going on down here. And he got the intellectuals, good old modern-day scholars today. Let's go to Greece, Plato and Aristotle. Philosophy. When you study philosophy, one of the earliest people that you will study are these two blokes, Aristotle and Plato. Plato and Aristotle opened up the philosophy where they start to critique Christianity, use reason above the Word of God. In fact, a lot of the, in fact, it is very possible that some of the famous philosophers during those days, and there were definitely many of the current students of that time who were trained under Plato and Aristotle, they were mocking the Apostle Paul when he preached at them at Mars Hill. And they mocked the Apostle Paul about his preaching of the resurrection. So the gospel was very cold in there. And Satan noticed that, see? And when he noticed that, he says, okay, then I'm going to use this bunch to affect the world so that they don't have to listen to Bible-believing Christianity. And then what was even worse is that it starts, so philosophy, the devil started to use that one. And then the devil started to use something else. He started to use... Alexandria, Egypt. Alexandria, Egypt took the philosophies of the Grecians and it carried down all the way to Alexandria. Alexandria, they became the enemy camp of this one. They became the enemy camp where they start to make their own manuscripts. Where the KJV was came, came from in Antioch, Alexandria, where it came from, was the good old modern versions. So let's put the NIV right here because that's the most idealistic one. So that's, there were your modern Bibles, Alexandria, Egypt. They start to correct the Word of God thinking what they thought was the right words. Why? Because they were very smart people. They were very smart people. Too smart for God, they thought. So Alexandria was one of them. But who was another one, you think? Good old Rome. Rome. Rome, during that time period, was another enemy camp of the early Christians. In fact, what is very interesting, when the Nestorians came out, that when the Syrian Christians came out, they were considered to be the oddballs. And official Christianity that time, which were called the Western churches, they were kicked out by Alexandria and Rome. They were kicked out by both Alexandria and Rome. Rome came to the scene. And when Rome came to the scene, you know how the Catholic Church was born? Through this man right here, Constantine. The devil used a brilliant plan because Christianity was so strong and growing and becoming more powerful. The devil realized, I'm going to take Christianity, mingle it up with paganism. Yeah. And Constantine combined the two together. Rome was dying. Christianity was growing. 
and Rome cannot die because Satan had to use Rome in the end times one day at Revelation 17. So what does Satan do? Rome will continue its power. Constantine was, was determined to continue the power of Rome by what? Mixing it up with Christianity. And that's what he did. And that's how Rome survived. It was through religion, not through its secular power. But you know what? Pretty soon religion became secular power itself. The church fathers and the early popes were the ones who contr contributed to the teachings of Roman Catholicism. And Roman Catholicism, its teachings, you must understand, did not come out immediately. It came out through a process of time. That's how heresy always works. That's how sin always works. Through a process of time, right? If you look at your own life, <laughs> that's how it always works. Process of time. Church fathers and early popes start to put up this Catholic doctrine and that Catholic doctrine. And then that's how Catholicism was born. Pope Sirius was the one who created the word Pope. Church Father Augustine said sprinkling baptism for babies was salvation. Church Father Augustine was also the one who applied all verses for Israel to the Roman Catholics as spiritual Israel. Hi, Stephen Anderson. Celestine I, he replaced the pagan goddess with the Virgin Mary. That's why they exalt the Virgin Mary so much. That's right. Why? Because it came from a pagan goddess. Yep. Well, strange why they would exalt her too much, huh? Church Father Jerome was the one who created the Catholic Latin Vulgate Bible. So now they, have, they also have another Bible coming out, the Latin Bible. The Latin Vulgate. And this Latin Vulgate became the one that became the enemy camp of this one. And through this line of manuscripts, through this stream of history, the devil start to use these people. And guess what? The devil accomplished this goal. Christianity disappeared. And now we came to known as the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages. This was a time of great darkness and great accomplishment from Satan. Satan won during this time period. Christianity faded and it fell away. Blind dependency on the church. Why? Due to illiteracy of the scriptures in what? Latin. It was all in Latin that time. So because it was in Latin of that time period, the Christians couldn't find truth. And that's why they were slaves to what? Whatever these guys said. These guys said, why? Because these guys are smart. Listen to your modern scholars, the textual critics, Dan Wallace, James White. Listen to those guys. They know Greek and Hebrew. Listen to the Pope. Listen to those Jesuits. They've got many PhDs. What about your pastor? He doesn't have that many. Can he speak a couple different languages like my priest, like my Pope can? See, because of that, it became the Dark Ages because people cannot independently for themselves find the truth, but rather dependency on slaves to men. The popes were very corrupt. They slept with whores, bought the papal office with bribes, committed adultery on the supposed tombs of Peter and Paul, had dozens of illegitimate children running around the Vatican, lavished themselves with billions of dollars worth of gold that they went far beyond debt and bankruptcy. And guess what? They did all these sins in the name of Jesus. That's right. They did all these sins in the names of Jesus. Makes you proud of your old church back then, huh? During this time period, it was a great time of darkness, and Satan accomplished his goal. Why? It just takes a couple hundred years, process of time, just like our Christian life, and then he'll accomplish his goal. The Inquisition was another tool of Satan. The Inquisition, it was a... It was a horrendous, torturous period. Besides the death of our Lord Jesus, I can't think of any time period worse than the tortures of the Inquisition. I'd even probably say it was worse than the, than the Holocaust. In the Inquisition, they pulled you up to court without you even knowing why you were brought in, and they forced you through torture to confess to crimes you didn't even commit. The tortures, it was horrible. You just read Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I won't go through all the tortures, but just some. One torture device was the pulley, where they would tie your hands with thin pieces of rope. And because your hands were tied like this, and they would pull you up with those thin pieces of rope like this, they would put a, approximately 100 pounds on your feet. And with that, your arms are tended to 
break through this way. And many times their arms broke, and guess what they did? They reset the arms and did it all over again. They did it all over again. They would also use the rack. The rack, they would tie, tie thin pieces of rope on their hands and their legs, and they would stretch them. So that's what the rack was. And they would stretch them because those ropes were so thin. It is said that those ropes would tear through the skin, muscles, and even almost reach the bone. And Fox's Book of Martyrs record that the blood was squirted out to five to seven different directions. The worst part was the burning stake. Now, the burning stake is not a walk in the park, folks. You got to realize that you can literally burn for hours. Burning for hours. If you were lucky, if you were lucky to die at the stake, you would actually renounce your belief. And what those priests would do is they would tie gunpowder bags around the victim's neck and let the fire catch onto the gunpowder so, gun so that their heads can blow off. And that was merciful. That's the easiest way to die. Because they didn't want to burn for hours at the stake. It was horrible, the Inquisition. The total number of killed victims, you know how much they ranged? 50 to 100 million. 50 to 100 million people. That's how horrible the Inquisition was. So it was a time of great darkness. And that's when God started to revive Christianity. The Reformation came in. The Reformation came in. The Lord decided to make a combat. And these people start to come into the scene. As Bible-believing Christians, our history was about to die out. The Lord raised up a new brand of people. The Vedas during that time. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I'm not sure. But they were considered to be the old-time, old-time Waldensians. In fact, when the Catholics had their Bible, these people had our, their Bible. That's where the KJV traditional text came from. Amen. And that's where we call it the Old Latin. They had the Latin Vulgate, but these guys had the Old Latin. This is one of the greatest evidences supporting the ancient manuscripts of our King James Bible. This thing can go back as well from somewhere to be between 150 to 180 AD that time. So there is historical record that they had this kind of Bible during that time period, the Old Latin. So the Vaudois, these people were around Southern and Central Europe. So this is where the Lord used these guys, that Southern and Central Europe. These people People, during that time period, they would assign people in houses to memorize passages. And, you, and us church, shame on us, we only get one verse a week. And these people would memorize passages and chapters of the Bible when they meet together. In fact, when that's how the King James Bible was preserved. You know how the Lord preserved it? Not just through these people when they hide the manuscripts, tearing off pages and pictures, putting them in their coats, but they would memorize it. Wow. They would hide them in their heart. That's how it was preserved. That's how it was preserved. That's how the Lord used mightily these people. In fact, when one was about to be burned at the stake, he told those Catholics that, hey, you better buy more wood to burn than more of us Waldensians to burn because we're going to multiply. Why? Because he quoted, the word of God endureth forever. You know what he meant by that? The word of God in their minds, in their hearts. So he says, we're going to live and we're, it's going to be preserved. We're going to continue. So that's how the Lord mildly used them. They shook up the Catholic powers at Southern and Central Europe. But then God raised up another person, Savonarola. Savonarola. God raised him at the headquarters of the Italy, where the Roman Catholic Church was. Savonarola, during that time, he ministered in Italy. And when Savonarola was ministering in Italy... He was a preacher who was forbidden to continue under the ban of the Pope, but he didn't care and he kept preaching and ministering. In fact, he even held bonfires at his city to burn pornographic, pagan, and worldly objects. Boy, and then they'd call him a heretic. People today will call that extremism, right? right. Man, look at these. Look at that. What happened to us, man? Look at these guys, man. Christians back then. Christians back then. When he was offered a red Catholic cardinal's hat, he instead replied, I'll take a red hat of blood for Jesus Christ instead. <laughs> and that's what he got. Yep. That's what he got. He was burnt at the stake. And the priest said, said to him, 
So I'm just going to ad lib it, all right? I'm going to ad lib it. But the priest told him when they, he was about to be burnt at the stake, I separate thee from the church of Rome. I separate thee from the church of God. But Savonarola, he said this, you can separate me from the church down here, but you can't separate me from the church up there. That's, right. That's what he said. So he said, so basically the, the quote went like this, the church militant, yes, but the church triumphant, no. What he meant was this, this earthly church, yes, but not the church up there, up in glory. Boy, the devil was mad, and then, but God raised up more Christians. Wycliffe was the next one. He was known as the morning star of the Reformation. He was a brilliant man. He ministered in England. Now God was using them in England now, not just Italy, southern central Europe, but now England. He was a scholar of Oxford, and you know how he wrote the entire English Bible? By hand. By hand. They didn't have printing presses back then. He wrote the whole English Bible by hand. His followers were so poor, and they were poor, ragged street preachers. Kind of familiar? Kind of familiar? Yeah. Look at us today. And you know what they were called? They were called lollards that time. They were called lollards. When Wycliffe was a, uh, fell ill near death, the Catholic friars, they hurried to his bedside, hoping that he would repent. Wow. But you know what Wycliffe instead said? He instead preached at them, I shall not, I'm saying quote for quote, I shall not die, but live, and again declare the evil deeds of the friars. Wow. And you know what? God spared his life, and he kept kicking them ever wow. since. <laughs> for a sick man, he, he had a lot of life in him. And then God raised up another man, John Huss. Now the Lord was going to use him around Czechoslovakia on Bohemia that time. It was called Bohemia of that time period. John Huss, he was influenced by John Wycliffe's writings. He was known as the scholar of Prague. And because that man, he was preaching to the people in the common tongue of that day, which was forbidden because you had to do Latin. Why? That's where your Bible came from, the Catholic Church says. The Latin Vulgate. But John Huss, he preached to them in the common tongue. And because of that, they tied him to the stake and they condemned him to be burnt at the stake. But when he was tied to the burning stake, he instead rejoiced, quote, My Lord Jesus Christ was bound with a harder chain than this for my sake. Why then should, by, should I be ashamed of this rusty one? <laughs> when the priest opened up his arms, and the priest said, We commit thy soul to the devil. John Huss, he cried out, But I commit my soul into thy hands, O Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he died being burnt alive at the stake. He died singing hymns. That sounds like a Bible believer, right? That sounds like old Christian. What happened to Christianity today? Shame, shame, shame on you, man. Shame on you. The same day that John Huss was burnt alive, you know what they did? The same day he was burnt alive, they dug up John Wycliffe's dead body out of the grave, and they brought it to court, and they condemned it. I mean, he was already dead. But they dug up the dead body of Wycliffe, put it on tr found it guilty on trial, and then burnt his dead body and threw the ashes on the Elbe River. Because the Catholics wanted to make an example. They were sick and tired of these guys. And they said this, oh, Look, it doesn't matter if you're alive like us and you're dead. The same day that you're alive, we're going to burn you up, John Huss. And he, the same day he was burnt alive was the same day that they found it, his dead body guilty in trial and t got rid of the ashes. So they said, doesn't matter if you're alive or dead, we're still in charge. You, we're still in charge. Don't mess with us. But Huss, he gave a prediction. He cried out to them, one day... Uh, you, you are now going to burn a goose. That means him, Huss. But in a century, you will have a swan which you can neither roast nor boil. And God bless that prediction. And we'll see who that swan is later on. But then the Lord was setting things up. God used another person, Erasmus. Erasmus was a genius. If you want to know one of the most genius manuscript scholars, even the textual critics will not deny it. They'll have to admit Erasmus as one of the top. The one of the top three. Erasmus is one of the most brilliant men of that time. He was praised by kings all over. In fact, even King Henry VIII, one of the worst kings, praised Erasmus. Erasmus, because he had to translate the Bible, and wh which our King James Bible came from, where are you going to get the manuscripts? Where are you going to get the books? 
the Catholic Church had it all. So he had to go with the Catholic Church to do that. But you know what? He was not a really good Catholic because he was writing tracts critiquing some of the popes and the Catholic Church. And that's where the Textus Receptus manuscripts came from. From the Waldensian's Old Latin Bible, as well as a combination. And guess what? The Lord you mightily used Erasmus of that time period, where the King James Bible started to spread. From Erasmus, that's where you got, in, where it eventually spread into Luther's German, Diodati's Italian, Olivetan's French, Valera's Spanish, Tyndale's English, and all the right Bible languages today. Because it came, the Textus Receptus Greek manuscripts came from Erasmus of that time. And that's how the Lord mightily used him of that time period. So while he was acting like a good Catholic by day, not saying anything bad, by night he was writing tracts critiquing the Catholic Church system. Then the Lord raised up the swan. And Erasmus was contemporary with this swan at that time period. Martin Luther. Martin Luther was that swan. They burned the goose. But the Lord was going to raise up a swan. Martin Luther, during that time, now the Lord was going to minister to Germany. Germany was now the intention of that time period. In Germany, Martin Luther was a dedicated Catholic monk. And he earned his doctorate as well and became a priest. But Martin Luther, when he went, to the, when he went on a pilgrimage to Rome, Luther, out of adoration to Rome, bowed on his knees and he said, Rome, holy Rome, I salute thee. But then when he went inside the city of Rome, he was shocked to see so much fornication, drinking, gambling, uh, irreverence in the church, in the city. That You know what Martin Luther said one time out of disgust? He said this, this is not some Bible-believing preacher today, okay? I'm talking about 1,500s people, all right? You know what Luther said? If there is a hell, Rome is built upon it. Amen. <laughs> that's what he said. If there is a hell, Rome is built upon it. And during that time, that's how the Lord used it. He read Romans chapter 1, the just shall live by faith. He realized it's by faith alone, not by salvation, by works. And that's how he got saved. And what he did was he posted 90-something arguments in his long thesis. And then he started, and you know what he did? He stamped it in front of the Catholic Church door. And so many people saw it that they were spreading it like wildfire. During that time period, the Pope, you know how the largest Catholic Church was built, St. Peter's Cathedral? You know how that church was built? By Pope Leo. Pope Leo, he needed money. He was getting bankrupt. Excuse me. He was, getting, he was losing money, bankrupt, and he needed more money. So you know what that godforsaken devil did? What he did was this. We're going to make a big sale of indulgences. So basically, if you buy this piece of paper called an indulgence, you're going to get full forgiveness of sins. And not only that, one of your loved ones who's burning in purgatory, that person's soul will go up immediately to heaven if you buy this indulgence. Boy, people were... You betcha so many poor damn souls bought it because they were in the dark ages. They didn't know. Luther, he got mad. So he posted 90-something arguments in front of that Catholic church door and that started to spread like wildfire. And when that started to spread like wildfire, I mean, it started to reach the ears of the big shot through the Vatican and eventually the Pope. The ears of the Pope heard it. And when they read one of, those, one of those statements on the paper, oh, it's just gold, I like it. Luther said this, if the Pope really has pure Christian charity and he has the power of God's forgiveness, why does he not empty up all of purgatory right now? <laughs> Boy, he got mad. And the Pope, he said, what drunken German wrote those words? And they said it was Martin Luther. And the Pope, he said, we're going to make a ban on Martin Luther. We're going we're gonna to excommunicate communicate him. You've got 60 days to retract your writing. But I guess the mail came in late. And when Luther got the mail, he said, when do I retract my writing? They said, tomorrow. So you know what Luther did? He held a big bonfire at Wittenberg, Germany. And he took that papal bull that gave him his excommunication. And he told in front of all Wittenberg, Rome, because you destroyed the works of God, let God destroy you in these flames. And he tore that papal bull in half, threw it in the fire, and all of the uh, Christians in Wittenberg, they were like going, yeah, they threw all the Catholic objects, Catholic books, papal bulls into the fire. Boy, that did not help. That did not help the Pope after that. So now it finally reached the big shot ears of King Charles that time. King Charles, he was the most powerful emperor of that time period. 
The most powerful religious leader, the Pope. The most powerful secular leader, King Charles. And when Martin Luther was brought up in front of King Charles, he said this, that... I cannot go against conscience. Now, this sounds like a Bible believer, right? I cannot go against conscience because it is bound to the text of the Bible. To go against conscience is neither right nor, st nor safe. So I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand, so help me God. Amen. And that's what he did. And then, guess what? Now the secular leader, King Charles, had to kick him out too. So Luther was excommunicated everywhere. There was no way he was going to survive. But you know, the Lord preserved him. He had one of the dukes hiding Luther. And that's where Luther produced the Luther's German Bible for people to read today. That's how the Lord mightily used him. And you know what? The Catholic Empire started crumbling. Because one by one, more dukes start to listen. Princes and dukes and rulers start to listen to Luther. And King Charles' empire was crumbling. Because now it was Protestant powers and Catholic powers. And the Muslims were also invading the Catholic countries at that time. The Catholic Empire was losing its power. D-Day came. The Dark Ages was crumbling. God said, Catholic Church's power, your time is up now. And King Charles, he finally held a final meeting with all the dukes and rulers. And with those Protestant duke and rulers, he said, Unite with us. Don't let the empire crumble. Under the banner of Holy Mother Church, renounce these heresies. And you know what those dukes did? They even heard the rumors that they could be tortured by the Spanish Inquisition. And you know what? The worst branch of the Inquisition was the Spanish Inquisition. But you know what those rich, high and mighty elite dukes and rulers did? They started to bow on their knees and they said, if you, want, if you want to kill me, you can go ahead and chop off my head right here, right now. And then one by one, the dukes start to do that. And the king can't do that because he needs those people to keep the empire going. So he couldn't do that. And they said, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now made free Christian men. Free now and free forever. Amen. And they said, Amen. That's how we were free today, church. Bless God. God freed some of you from that devilish church, didn't He? Right. Thank God for that one. Amen. And the Lord, He freed us. He gave us freedom indeed. And the Catholic Church, that powerful empire, finally crumbled. Then there was the swan. But God was not done. God started to raise up more people. The devil was getting heyday. Another person was John Knox. Now he was going to shake up Scotland through John Knox. John Knox, he was considered to be the founder of the Presbyterian Church. His prayers were so powerful that it shook up the whole nation of Scotland. They imprisoned John Knox in the galleys for 19 months. If you want to know the worst kind of slavery and imprisonment of that time period, it was the galleys. And they imprisoned him over there for 19 months. But you know what? He still prayed. He still prayed and he still shook up Scotland. In fact, he put the fear of God all over Scotland that the Catholic Queen of Scotland, Mary Queen of Scots, she, said, she cried out, I fear John Knox's prayers more than all the assembled armies of Europe. That's how the Lord mightily used John Knox. But the Lord was not done. He started to raise up more people. And he raised up another person, William Tyndale. William Tyndale was another key player for the King James Bible today, you must understand. William Tyndale, he was one time at a table eating with a few Catholic scholars, and they were talking about the Pope. And William Tyndale, he told those Catholic scholars, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life, <laughs> ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to, more, to know more of the scriptures than the Pope does. <laughs> They got mad. They got mad and went off in a rage after that. Boy, his life was marked. You know what, what time period Tyndale was in? Which, which king of England that time? One of the worst kings of England, King Henry VIII. This guy had no chance to give us the Bible today. He was getting chased all over by King Henry VIII and the Catholic Church Empire. There was no safety for Tyndale. But you know what? William Tyndale, he kept translating the Bible. He kept translating the Bible to English. And guess what? The Catholics caught him. They finally caught him and tied him to the stake. And guess what? He didn't finish the English Bible yet. So guess what? We're going to lose the Bible. It's too late now. But William Tyndale, he was tied up to the stake and he gave one last cry to God. He cried out, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. 
There's no way that's going to happen. King Henry VIII, no way, no way in the world. But you know what? After he was burnt alive at the stake, King Henry VIII took Tyndale's Bible and had some of his scholars look through it, and they can't find genuine flaws with it. And King Henry VIII, you know what that, that messed up man, that wicked king said? Lord, that's how God uses wicked men, man. He can use anybody. King Henry VIII said, If there be no heresies in this book, let this book be spread abroad through all the people. Yeah. Finally, people had access to the Bible. They couldn't for, for centuries until a wicked king named King Henry VIII gave them freedom. And guess what? He, he was so arrogant and wicked that he broke off from the Catholic Church. And because of that, England, God turned his attention to England. And that's how Bible-believing Christianity was grown and preserved and raised. It was because of England. And how did God use it? A wicked king named King Henry VIII. Isn't your God amazing, folks? Amen. Man, and so the Catholics, they lost England. And the English Bible spread that time. Before we go back to England, this is an important group of people that you need to know. And that's where our Baptist heritage came from. Not officially, but these people were one of the root causes. These were called Anabaptists. Why were they called Anabaptists? In fact, these people were considered to be really radicals and extremists compared to the official Christians, these guys. Even these guys thought that these guys were extremists. Why? Because these people went so much by the Bible. And some of these people, even though they were safe Christians and God used them, they still held on to some Catholic influence. But these Anabaptists start to dismiss more and more Catholic teaching. That start to look radical and extremist. Sounds familiar? Yeah. Small fringe of weird radicals yeah. who breaks off from the official godly Christians. I mean, who, who, who? I wonder. Bible believers, welcome to the fold. Welcome yeah. to the fold. When you touch that book, man, it's going to do something to you. That's right. It's going to do something to you. And these Anabaptists, they were known for knowing so much Bible. Knowing so much Bible. They were like Bible believers today who debated successfully. And then both Catholics and Protestants couldn't crush these Anabaptists. And both groups actually persecuted the Anabaptists. But they couldn't crush them with Bible because they knew too much. They knew too much of the book. They knew too much of the Word of God. In fact, one Anabaptist who debated so successfully in front of the Catholic Council... He had his tongue cut out. His flesh was torn seven times by iron tongs. And he was finally burnt alive. But before all that happened, you know what he told his Catholic persecutors? Those Catholic scholars who supposedly knew much of the Bible? He said this. This sounds like a Bible believer. Send for the most learned men. If they show us with Holy Scripture that we are in error and wrong, we will gladly retract and recant and will gladly suffer condemnation and the punishment for our offense. But if we cannot be proved in error, I hope to God that you will repent and let yourselves be taught. <laughs> that sounds like a Bible believer today, right? That, no wonder these guys were radicals, extremists that time. And that was how the Anabaptists were born. Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim of San Jose Bio Baptist Church. Have you ever asked this question that if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven? My friend, it's so simple to get saved. You first got to realize that you can't go to heaven because you've sinned against God. And God, as a holy judge, he has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you feel sorry over your sinful condition. And if you do, there is hope for you. You see, Jesus, who is God, left heaven, came down here on earth, died on the cross, raised himself from the dead. Why did he do all that? So his blood can wash away the sins for you. So you see, that's your only way to heaven, of what he did on the cross, and not what you do in cleaning up all your sins, and going to church, getting baptized, or doing any sort of good work. It's faith alone in what Jesus did on the cross. If you can do that, then all you have to do is say that to God. You might say, well, I don't know how to say it. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I am sorry for being a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sins. I trust in that alone and not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 
Congratulations, my friend. If someone were to ask you, how did you get saved? It's very simple, right? What did you do? I just put my faith on what Jesus did on the cross. That's it. My friend, congratulations on your salvation. Right now, because Satan can't damn you to hell, what he's going to try to do now is try to ruin your life. And he did a very good job in this world. That's why it's so hard to find truth, and there are so many lies with a gazillion different churches, different Bibles, different beliefs, different religions. So my friend, it is so important to grow in truth and get involved in a Bible-believing work that can save you from a lot of trouble. There are four things we recommend for you to do, which is found in the resources link below. Number one, get involved in a Bible-believing church near you. Number two, study the King James Bible issue and have only that kind of Bible, no other modern version Bible. Number three, study dispensationalism so you can find the right doctrine and truth. Number four, study only under Bible-believing teachers. My friend, this is all explained further in the resources link below, so please click on it and get to work in a Bible-believing work because you only have one life to live for Him, and you don't want to waste it away by the devil. And I'll be inside that great palace, and the smoke will be so thick, I'll drop to my knees, and I'll drop to my face like those Navy SEALs do, and I'll start crawling, i start crawling, and I'll look down that uh, ivory aisle there, and I'll see a, a throne, and I'll see some feet, that got holes in them, and they got jewel sandals on. Then I'll pull myself up to those feet and I'll cry on those feet like that woman that cried on his feet, wiped the tears with her hair. Hey, glory to God, you're going to let him do the shining. You're going to say, oh God, thank you. Hallelujah. And the angels will worship and the cherubim will worship and the seraphim will worship and thank God an independent family will worship. Another song said, Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven and found a Savior Amen. to save a poor lost soul like me. Woo! Glory to God. He stood out there in my Sodom and he's go, Ho, 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 Jesus saves. <laughs> the Bible says, for God's And he's preaching, and the, and the people that's ringing the bell, there we go. Uh, <laughs> And he'd stand up, and, uh, and people walk up and they said, Wow, Santa Claus preaching. What? Then you enter the throne of glory. Yeah. Oh, oh, the Father opens up his arms. Come on, there's a banner raised up in the sky yeah. with all the angels. You're going to the church. through Buddha. It's not through the commandments. It's only through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm just going to stay still and I'm just study at home. Uh, <laughs> I watch preaching on the TV. You can turn the preacher off. You can turn me off. like your skin turning to gold or something you don't know what's going on it's about two more steps here's that crowd hi how you doing hey mom hi dad hey Steve. hey she got that way down there at the edge of that street there's the lord up there in glory and down he comes off that throne he always would come down for a sitter <laughs> and he comes down there well done now good and faithful servant of the joy of our lord that old boy's heart going down there it says Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Then he laid down on that table, and Dr. Grace got out the scalpel, and he removed that old cold stony heart out of my friend. Oh, he threw it in the trash can, and he put a brand new heart into my friend's chest. And when he when he woke up, uh, he looked around and he said, "Oh my." Everything has been changed. Everything looks different. 
Oh, I'm so happy now that I had the heart operation. Hey, praise God, for there's no other savior like our God.